Hello there. And um, welcome to the 2022 MIT Sloan Sports Analytics Conference Competitive Advantage Talk presented by Kager, also known as the Craft Analytics Group. My name is Nahom Brahane, and I'm a first year MBA student here at MIT Sloan. It is my honor to present the presentation Brick and Mortar Integration for Digital Customers presented by Caesar Sportsbook. And please help me welcome Divi Jayasaleen, VP Marketing Analytics for Caesars. Thanks, Tom. Appreciate it. Okay, thanks. Hello, everyone. Um, so, for those of you who are here for Adam's talk, it's really fascinating. We learned a lot about how the Braves are using um, digital assets to talk to their brick and mortar customers. And I'm here to tell you about the exact opposite about how we are looking at our digital customers and trying to integrate them into brick and mortar. Not because we view it as a replacement, but as a supplement that we think really extends their value. So um, one of the things that I think is most exciting about this space right now is just um, where valuations are. We talked about um, just the growth of sports betting. There's a, a lot of key players here, um, and they are uh, really competing on what I feel is, in some ways, a largely commoditized product. Um, now, there are some differences across platforms. You see promotions change. You see interfaces change, technology changes. There's maybe a little bit of a different strategy that different operators employ. But at its core, what we're offering people is the opportunity to wager on an outcome. And when you're dealing with a commoditized product, so you're really competing on price. Um, now, one of the challenges that we, we face in this industry, Michael Rubin actually talked about it a little bit today, is what is our cost per customer acquisition? It's, in some cases, very high. And if we continue to chase that customer at a very high CPA, what we're going to see is that the investor sentiment is going to change. Right now, things are still very much driven by top line DAUs. Um, but there's a, a shift in the mindset of a lot of investors in this space right now to think more from an EBITDA perspective. So in order to be successful here, we've got to think and change how we operate. Uh, it can't be really just about growing that top line. Um, so that's what's most exciting to me about where we are in this space. It's really a time where uh, the landscape is shifting a little bit, people's thinking is shifting a little bit, and as an analytics professional, I get to be at the center of driving that change, which is really exciting. So um, as Nahom uh, alluded to, my name is Divi Jayasil, and I've been with Caesars for about 10 years now. Um, it was a really exciting time when I joined Caesars because we were at the middle of centralizing analytics in Las Vegas. So we used to have planning and analysis and analytics professionals spread out across all our properties um, all over the country. And everyone did things a little bit differently. No one was learning from one another. We had the thesis that if you get enough smart people together in a room, good things are going to happen. And I think that's borne itself out over the last 10 years. And um, I think this conference is a great example of that. Hopefully, we get enough smart people and some good things happen as a result of this conference. But, um, and that's some, that's some interesting formatting we've got on that slide. But. Um, but, but one of the things, what I wanted to really talk to you guys about today is how do we compete not on price with a commoditized product? And the way we've thought about this is we have something that many other players in this space don't have, and that's a robust brick and mortar business. So how can we use that to differentiate ourselves? So three big things that we looked at as competitive advantages that we did not based on price. One is to leverage what we've learned over the years through our, our Caesar Rewards program. For those of you who aren't familiar with the casino industry, um, the Caesar Rewards is the loyalty program that kind of drives the engine of everything we do from a marketing perspective, from a customer loyalty perspective. Um, it's how we talk to customers, it's how we learn about customers, and how we um, really drive the insights that the analytics teams generate. Um, we wanted to figure out ways to reduce friction that customers experience. So today, uh, we have this, this dichotomy between what customers experience online versus what they experience offline. We also have this interesting problem, we had this interesting problem years ago, when a customer would travel to Las Vegas, um, but in their hometown of Hammond, in Hammond, um, they might be there every single day, they might be treated like a VIP, um, suddenly you come to Las Vegas and we don't know who you are. We had to figure out a way to bridge that gap, and similarly, we face a similar problem today. Um, and now, the Pareto rule is uh, apparent in any business. No one, no, it just, it's huge within the gaming industry. Um, so it's really all about how do we create something that 
drives our VIP customers, that extends their LTV, that keeps them loyal to us. Um, and we've done some things on the brick and mortar side that somewhat apply to what we do online. Some things are a little bit different, but um, we've got a platform to learn, and that's, that's what's really key here. And I think what's most exciting for me is this isn't something that is a uh, strategy that's driven by someone who's not really paying attention to what the numbers say. Um, we are a very data-driven company, and as a result, we really get to be at the center of some of these big strategic changes within our organization. So, little history lesson for, um, for you guys. So, go back to the start of 2000, and obviously the pandemic hits. Um, the first signs, we saw the first signs of this in February where um, our Asian business in, in Chicago really started falling off a cliff. Um, and we thought, this is gonna be a real problem. <laughs> and it turned out to be a real problem. We closed all of our properties. We furloughed 99% of our workforce. Um, and then in the midst of all that, we went through a merger uh, with a company called El Dorado Resorts. Now, what was interesting about this company is, is you're bringing together two very different data so sources. So there were a lot of challenges inherent there. But you're also bringing together two very different cultures of decision making. So Caesars has long had centers of excellence that say, you know, let's do things this way, let's push down a corporate standard, and let's apply that to all our properties. Um, the El Dorado line of thinking was very different. It was all around the mindset of, let's make decisions as close to the consumer as we possibly can. So that gave a lot of autonomy to our general managers, to our regional operators, and they then shared those best practices back up through corporate. So it, it was a very different way of thinking, of, of operating a, a business, and we both had to adapt to kind of find a healthy middle ground. And now, uh, last year, we acquired William Hill. Uh, so again, Couple that, couple two corporate cultures together, two completely disparate data sources coming together, um, and really a brand new business for us to adopt. Um, I think it's very easy for people to look at sports betting and casinos and think about them as a fairly unified customer experience, fairly unified kind of way of thinking. Um, but, but something really had to change for us to talk, for these two metrics to talk to each other. So one of the first things we had to do when um, figuring out how to bring these companies together was how do we understand these customers across all these different platforms? We could have a customer who walks into a property in, Lo in Las Vegas, property in Louisiana, gambles with us online, plays World Series of Poker. We might treat those as four completely different customers if we don't have some way to bring them together. Um, so that was really the first step, is how do we link all these customers together? And the answer was Caesars Rewards. So we went through a process of enrolling customers into the program. We went through a process of asking customers to link their accounts. We're, for analysis purposes, doing some fuzzy matching on the back end, involving you know, you know, language, uh, you know, if this, then that kind of, kind of stuff. Um, but basically, we wanted to chart try, tying together all the different behaviors that customers, um, that, that customers experience with us. Now, once you're able to do that, all these other things kind of fall into place. You're able to do really robust analysis on where customers are in their life cycle, um, what the impact of certain interventions are, and um, really start testing and learning kind of what's most, impact, most effective in driving consumer behavior. So we touched on Caesars Rewards, and, and the reason it's such a big thing for us and a differentiator for us is looking at kind of how we acquire customers. Um, we find that the customers that we are able to drive through the loyalty program are a much lower CPA, obviously, but what's most interesting is understanding kind of the, their long-term value. We find that of the new customers that have come to us through Caesars Rewards, while they're only a quarter of the actual new registrants, they make up an outsized portion of revenue. So we're gonna see a higher LTV from these customers. We can afford to spend a little bit more to keep them around. Um, and the reason that this works is not because we're competing on price. Um, you'll find that in most markets, most jurisdictions we operate in, um, we're at parity, or in some cases, not, not at parity in terms of our reinvestment levels. Um, but what we do offer is some things that other people can't. So um, our partnership with the NFL and our partnership with sports teams allows us to throw um, really cool parties. We actually had a party at Allegiant Stadium for the Super Bowl this year. It was um, really, really cool. Um, there's, there's a lot of non-financial non kind of intangible things that we're allowed to go offer customers in terms of status. Um, so that's really exciting. Um, these emotional factors that consumers experience with us, I think this is really interesting because 
in many cases, we're not giving consumers something that's, um, that costs us anything. Um, you know, I think about personal challenges. If someone comes into our casino and gambles $100, we might ask them, okay, come in next time, gamble $200, and we'll give you, it might just be a badge on your app. It might be something that's you know, just a digital kind of checkbox. Um, but consumers chase these things. Um, so it's, it's really interesting to me kind of understanding what can motivate people. And then, obviously, those transactional factors. Analytics is kind of touching all of these different areas, trying to understand, you know, when we throw a party, is it driving long-term consumer behavior, and was it profitable? Um, you know, when we uh, award customers different tiers, does that change their long-term behavior? And what's the relative health of our database across all these different tiers? And then, obviously, transactionally, how do we optimize our reinvestment? That's something that's, that's constantly being tested. Um, it, you know, and, and I think what's... Um, what set us apart on the brick and mortar side is that for a long time we've been testing, and I think people are trying to catch up to where we are in this, in this industry right now, um, but we've just learned so much about our customer base that we apply to every promotion that goes out the door. I won't belabor this point, but obviously we know a lot about our customers. I think Michael talked about having 50 or 60 different attributes on customers. Um, I think by our latest count, our kind of valuation engine has something like 200 columns on what customers do. Um, so we, we learn a lot about customers, and, and that goes back into how we personalize and target them. Um, we're also able to do things very segmented. Um, that's, that's a function of knowing a lot about our customers, having a big database, but also having the technology to execute against it, to be able to cut things in different ways and um, really efficiently um, put out really targeted messages. So I touched on some of those best practices that we've observed over, over years. Um, what was fun over the last year and what's, what continues to be fun for me is we're learning more. Like we're having to adapt to figure out how these things that we've learned really apply to casino, uh, to sports betters, I should say. Um, one of the things that was most evident right off the bat is how we value these customers. So, um, you know, obviously with a casino, everything's all about expected value and, and long-term value tends to play out. Um, you know, you see the expected value and the actual value of a customer to converge over time. Um, with sports bettors, the, the outcome is far more volatile. You could have a customer who's betting $1,000 on a game and in a course of 10 games, you could have really extreme outcomes. That, that doesn't tend to happen as much on the brick and mortar side, but you could see that happen in sports a lot more frequently. So what we found was we had to find a way to control for that volatility in how we valued guests. And it doesn't mean that we had to start from scratch. It doesn't mean we threw out the old way of doing things. It meant that some of those metrics and some of those variables just had to be tweaked. On the brick and mortar side, we tend to focus on in-trip profitability, and that's a function of kind of where we've been at a company, going through bankruptcies, IPOs, and, and just kind of always having this short-term mentality about driving profit. Um, but when you've got a digital business where transactions are far more frequent, the volatility of behavior is daily, it's not, you're not trying to drive a customer to come to your property, you're driving a customer to pull out their phone and start making a bet. Um, so that's a very different experience. You've got to look at that customer on a long-term basis. So that, allowed, that, that caused us to change some tools, um, really understand what churn and retention looks like. Um, I think for the last 10 years, Caesar Rewards has been all about the retention side of marketing. And what's exciting about talking to sports bettors is we're talking about the acquisition side of things. And now we're just, just now transitioning that sports business to start thinking about, okay, now that you're in the database, what can we do with you long term? Customer evaluation. So, um, again, we've tended to think about customer evaluation purely in a vertical or a market basis. So, um, you know, a customer who, who plays with us in, uh, let's say, L Louisiana, um, and then cousins to visit Las Vegas, that customer generally doesn't spend as much on that trip to Las Vegas. Why is that? It's because there's a bunch of stuff to do in Las Vegas. So, someone's probably going to a restaurant or going to a show or, or doing something that they otherwise couldn't do in their home property. Um, but if you were to look at that customer purely on a gaming basis, you might say, well, that customer is not as valuable. If you look at that customer's total spend on that trip, it's generally as profitable, maybe even more profitable. Um, but it doesn't really do me much good to know, you know, this customer is worth $200. I need to know what they're spending the $200 are. It allows me to target my message, allows me to figure out the right reinvestment mechanism in them. Um, and similarly, we have this problem on iCasino, on poker, on sports. Those customers are all inherently different. Um, I, I, I think that one of the things that 
I, it was an eye-opening experience for me. It was learning just how, how consolidated revenue is within the poker world and, and, and just how valuable those top customers are. It was, it was eye-opening when I saw some of those stats. But um, you know, if you value guests independently and don't figure out a way to really holistically think about them, you're going to run into problems. The challenge that all these different verticals and all these different markets and all these different products creates is that the customer's wallet becomes really fragmented. You've got to piece it back together to figure out what their total worth is. Um, but what we do know is that total worth increases as these guests engage with more products. So um, you know, these charts on the right show you a little bit about um, customers who engage with multiple markets. It's intuitive that as guests visit more markets, they're worth more to us. Um, what's not as intuitive is on a daily basis that relationship still holds. So independent of the fact that you're visiting more properties, you're, you're, you're growing your wallet as you visit these more properties. And I think that's our hypothesis is that comes from taking share away from our competitors. Um, we've also found that brick and mortar and online play is purely complementary. We've for a long time kind of had this um, concern within our operations that if a customer is now spending online, they're not going to come to my property. Um, we've looked at this time and time again and found that that's not the case. What really happens is that customer becomes more sticky and is, it, we actually see increases in visitation, increases in revenue when these customers engage with us on multiple platforms. And, and one of the things that I think is most interesting is just looking at what these sports bettors have started to do in our brick and mortar properties. Since, they, since we've um, integrated these two businesses over the last couple of months. Um, our CEO talked about this on an earnings call, but we're seeing huge run rates, nine figures, in terms of what these customers are generating on an annual basis. Now, in some cases, we're seeing sports bettors who come to us who are more valuable to us as a casino customer than they are as a sports better, which is pretty eye-opening. Uh, hotel discounting. So revenue management is probably one of the most fascinating problems we have in the gaming industry. And, um, I remember talking to um, our head of revenue management. He told me there's only one optimization problem that is harder than yielding a casino. Anyone have any idea what that is? Making a seating chart for a wedding. Yeah. Um, but we've had the same problem where differences in incentive plans and differences in structures and metrics have not allowed us to really holistically value guests when we, when we put them in the hotel. One of the things that analytics really spearheaded this last year is putting into place some work that, that, that changes how that works. So on this, this chart on the right, you're looking at kind of the customers who fall into different worth breaks of, of um, how we value them when they, when they check into a hotel. And there are some customers who, if we looked at their brick and mortar worth only, we would think of them as a very low worth customer. Um, and again, that creates friction when that customer really is a good online player. So we started seeing that there were customers who were moving up in worth, who were getting more hotel discounts, in some cases getting free rooms, and that really allowed us to um, uh, you know, you know, have the, put, the right, put the right room out there for the right customer, um, instead of just thinking about them through this one specific channel. Um, so game recommendations. We have a lot of data on consumers and what they, what they play when they're in our properties, what they play when they're online. Think about this like Netflix knows what we're watching, Amazon knows what we're shopping for, and they feed us recommendations that are tailored to us. Um, and we have that same ability too. And what we find is that increases customers' time on device. It increases their, um, it increases the amount of times that they, they'll shop with us or that they'll play with us. And um, just generally makes them more loyal customers. Uh, I won't get into this too much, but um, the takeaway here on our VIP customers is, you know, we've really got to figure out who these customers are and we've got to find out how to engage them. So um, we do a lot of work on propensity scoring, understanding what are the key attributes of who a VIP is, and how do we predict someone who's going to become a VIP. So rather than being reactive about it, we're a little bit more proactive. Um, our hosts are incredibly busy people. They're running around calling people. They're running around visiting customers on the casino floor. And one of the things that we can do that's most effective in delivering better profit outcomes is figuring out how to optimize their time. Um, so that's a big function of, of what the analytics team is responsible. And what we've seen over time is that, again, we've done studies on this multiple times, and found that once a customer is engaged by a host, that in-trip activity is actually more profitable for us. Um, and what's exciting is we're finding that that same relationship holds among sports bettors at a greater magnitude. So when a host reaches out and connects with a sports better, um, we're seeing fantastic returns on that. I think, 
I, I, I hypothesize that that has to do with the fact that host business hasn't been a staple of the sports betting industry. Loyalty hasn't been a sport staple of the sports betting industry. Um, so it's something that's brand new that's really encouraging people to, uh, to play with us. Um, so what I want you guys to take away from this, um, it's not that we figured out how to market to sports betters. We haven't. We're, we're still at the early stages of this. We're still figuring out where to go. But I'm very encouraged by the early results. If you think about where we were in brand awareness just uh, you know, 10 months ago, six, nine months ago, um, we've grown that number tenfold in, in a very short amount of time. Um, there's still a long way to go, but, but I'm really encouraged that we've been able to grow our brand. And we did it by leveraging our loyalty program and leveraging what we've learned about our customer. We did it by creating a guest experience that was holistic and it was a, like, a little bit more consistent. And we did it by figuring out a way to talk to our best customers. Now, where analytics is really uh, gonna, be, gonna be working towards in 2022 is figuring out what are these other ways that things have to be reworked in order for the, our business to, to thrive. Um, understanding a growth phase versus a mature phase company, understanding different metrics that apply to different businesses. Um, what's, what's encouraging for us at Caesars is we are dealing with uh, clients and stakeholders that are very accommodating this change. They're very interested in this change. And it makes my life easier when I've got people who want to get smarter. My job is to make you smarter. And if you're receptive to that information, um, you know, it, it creates a better environment. It creates biz better business outcomes. So that culture of learning, that culture of listening is what's been driving our success and what's going to continue to be our competitive advantage. So I'll turn it over to you guys. I'd love to hear from you. Um, and what questions can I answer about uh, where we are? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I guess the one question I had, it, it's pretty clear from your presentation how the digital side can increase the value at the brick and mortar properties. But I guess I'm curious if you've done any like share of wallet analysis to see how Caesars Rewards impacts different digital customers who are maybe line shopping across different sports betting apps. That, that's a consumer that is very difficult to drive loyalty among because their motivations are very different than a traditional, uh, than a traditional customer. I will say that Caesar Rewards has to adapt to accommodate that customer. So there's a lot of conversation, a lot of work underway to figure out how do we tailor this loyalty program to that customer and make it more relevant for them. So again, I wouldn't say we figured that puzzle out yet, but it's something that's, that's critical for our success. Um, so we're here looking at sports analytics also, and I'm wondering how much are you utilizing that for your sports books as far as predictive outcomes? Um, on, the, on the sports basis, you know, the data is being crunched. They have certain things that can predict who's going to win. Are you guys taking in that information? And, you know, what are your thoughts on that? I, I wouldn't say we do a ton with outside third-party vendors. Um, we actually like to build a lot of those capabilities on ourselves. So um, our trading team works closely with my counterpart, Brad Rodriguez, who leads our data science team, and is working to figure out what are the best models that we can put together for individual sports. And um, I, I think what's interesting is that they are approaching this from the very ground floor. I think there's no, um, no one's beholden to what the ways we've done things before. So. In, in many cases, we are trying to keep things running, but also in, the, in parallel, trying to build a better mousetrap. And um, what Brad and his team are really responsible for is figuring out exactly what you said, that, that best predictive model that we can put together um, that we want to own the IP for rather than you know, outsource to somebody else. Cool. And do we have time for one more question? Sure. Can you just talk about some of the um, partners at Caesars and colleagues of yours that have been instrumental and perhaps maybe some of those colleagues that you were able to tap into that you hadn't passed that enabled you to do a lot of this analysis and, and be able to evaluate um, the, you know, where you come from and where, where, where you're going, um, particularly with, with you know, valuation of your, your customers and loyalty. 
When you say partners, do you mean like from a hardware software perspective? No, no, just like internal, internally to uh, in, in, in Caesars, right? You know, marketing and, and you know, you know, data engineering, just, that, just those kinds of partners that you've been working with. Right, right. So uh, I'd say the analytics team is unique in that it touches basically every facet of the business. Um, and sports betting has become such a pervasive part of our business that it touches every single vertical. So within analytics, you know, my team is obviously very involved in it, but so is hotel analytics, um, gaming analytics, VIP analytics. Um, and we're partnering with people throughout the organization. So what's most, um, what's most effective in our ability to kind of drive outcomes is that we're sitting at the table with these people making those decisions. That's marketing operators, that's regional presidents and GMs of properties. Um, I, so I, I would say that the partnership, it's, it's, it's kind of a weird thing to say, but I don't really think about that partnership because it's just kind of second nature to how we operate. Um, so, but, but um, being able to partner with actual decision makers is kind of, you know, critical to what we do. Thank you. <laughs>